coming to you from Orange County, California. This is the Jug Life Podcast with Max Ada and Chad Wesley Smith. Hello, everybody. This is another episode of the Jug Life Podcast. I'm Chad Wesley Smith, joined as always by Machiavellian Max Montana. <laughs> How are you guys doing? And our special guest today, in what I'm sure has been a long awaited episode, let's just call it the Starting Strength episode. Hey. Our special guest today, Jordan Feigenbaum. Right. Not to be confused with Mark Ripito, but I am, in fact, <laughs> Jordan Feigenbaum. Thanks yes. for having me, guys. Today's episode is brought to you by hip drives and high fives. <laughs> and uh, I, you know, very excited to my first interaction ever with Jordan was telling him that he was weak on the internet uh, in, in a starting <laughs> strength fight. And I was like, I was like, oh, what are all these starting strength guys? And I was, you guys can squat as much as me put together. There was like four of them. I figured it was, you know, half, half, halfway accurate. And then it turns out the one strong guy who does starting strength was in the conversation. And so, just a quick bio for oh. for for Jordan uh, before I'll, I'll let him talk about himself. But he is <laughs> the the owner of uh, Barbell Medicine, okay. Oh, okay. conveniently right there on the shirt, and as well as the proprietor of one of the internet's finest websites. That's not heavy. dot <laughs> com. <laughs> I I have to give credit where credit is due. There's a guy in L.A. who actually had this idea to put that on the internet. So if you go to that's not heavy. dot com and press play, you'll be delighted. It's a good way to troll people on the internet. If you just tell them, yeah, go to this website. If they send you a video, so you just put that as a link, that works. Uh, you have to do like a, a Google URL though, so they don't know that that's what they're getting. That's oh right, 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 right. Yeah. That's all I do for my online coaching. <laughs> <laughs> when I'm critiquing people, I just send the link. There you go. You just said, you just said they said they sent a squat video, and you say <laughs> send them to that link. That works. Yeah, that's the seventh time Max got me with that's not heavy. <laughs> com. Yeah. If if you look back to Chad and I's first interaction, yeah, it was something about squatting and bending over yeah. or whatever, and then yeah, he said like, I squat more than everyone here, and I was like, no, oh man. I like I squatted some weight and he's like yeah no one cares about you <laughs> which is objectively true it's objectively <laughs> objectively true well besides and we'll get into what barbell medicine is but besides uh, I mean the hours months years it must have taken for the, just the coding of that's not heavy dot com <laughs> uh, what's a little bit of your uh, your lifting and education experience sure so I'll start uh, education wise first uh, I got a undergrad bachelor's degree in biology uh, in 2008 and I got a master's in anatomy and physiology from st. Louis University School of Medicine that was 2010 and then I earned my medical degree from Eastern Virginia Medical School uh, it was 20 16 went to residency at UCLA uh, then now moved up to Santa Cruz um, basically I'm trying to infiltrate the CrossFit ranks that's why I'm in I'm at ground zero uh-huh. yeah that's how it works uh, lifting wise less less impressive you know if you're a big ac- academic guy but uh, you know so I think my best total is 1795 is a 198 um, 640 squat 430 bench 725 deadlift and uh, yeah I'm still chasing former glory I feel like ever since that total, I've been like, oh, yeah, it's time to break that. You know, the 2,000 pound total would be, it's a 10 times body weight total, which would be dope. Is that 198 in not the USAPL or when the USAPL used to have 198s? Uh, so it's not the USAPL. My best total in the USAPL, I think 1707 or some odd communist number. <laughs> uh, this, <laughs> I did a meet where they were using pound plates, you know, like because we're in America. And uh, yeah, so that's how I got to 1795. Otherwise, you know, it'd be like 1794.6. Yeah, yeah. You have to put that on the internet. Well, link in bio. Like yeah. that's. <laughs> <laughs> well, then, so besides the lifting, your your main business yep. is barbell medicine. So tell us tell us what that is. Sure. Um, so when I. I used to coach a lot of people uh, while I was still getting my master's degree before I went off to medical school. And then when I went to medical school, um, it seemed to me that there was a need to kind of integrate, met, you know, 
allopathic medicine and lifestyle change as it pertains to strength and conditioning and nutritional changes, other lifestyle changes. And I felt like everybody was out there in the medical community was talking about exercise and that just meant walk more. That's like typically what they what they say. And I felt I'd been involved as a coach and in the strength and conditioning world for so long at that time that what better person to bring those two together than, than me. So it started off as a small uh, consulting company. We were working with both gyms who had a bunch of trainers who wanted to get educated and then also individuals who wanted programming or nutrition kind of work. And now we're doing seminars. Uh, we're also right. We literally writing the article um, for other doctors on strength training and health. So this is goes on a website called up to date. It's the doctors Google. They effectively, if you go in their office, they're going to look up on up to date, whatever it is you're there for to kind of get a, a you know, some info about it's like WebMD. It's basically yeah. WebMD, okay. yeah. But you know, the <laughs> one step up. But the, yeah, they contacted us. We had a guy go through the Starting Strength seminar who is like the senior editor there, and he contacted us and was like, "Hey, do you want to write the article for Strength and Health Outcomes?" And we we're like, "Uh, yeah." And then we made the outline, and it's you know, a, a ten-page outline of just all the points. And we're like, "Oh crap! Now we got to write this thing." <laughs> so it's almost done. Our first draft will be submitted next week, and then uh, the idea with barbell medicine though is to uh, you know, I tell they, people ask, you know, what's the five-year goal for barbell medicine? And the idea is to get uh, just just go lift weights more to be the next. Just go walk. You know, like I don't want that to be replaced. And I I just want every practitioner to feel comfortable with saying you need to train more. And because I think we've all seen it be very effective. You know, you guys work with a lot of high-end athletes, but you've also trained. You know people who want to get stronger get healthier and you've seen the benefit yeah. <laughs> Some. surprisingly people a lot of people don't come to me for, uh, for, <laughs> for <laughs> well it, you know it, it's just a very powerful tool that i feel like is not being used as much um and just a, a quick like you know for the internet because let's go on the internet you know less than six percent of all primary care physicians are actually recommending uh, resistance training to their patients and that's actually in the American College of Sports Medicine's recommendations for activity guidelines for adults in America so it's like it, we're supposed to be recommending it but people just aren't and when you ask them why they say ah, I don't have enough time I haven't done it myself I'm not comfortable recommending it. I have no idea what to refer them and I'm like that's fine I'll do it Barbell Medicine will do it so we need so we need more docs who lift yeah right that's funny because as as a coach not a doctor. I do recommend a lot of medical advice to my clients, <laughs> mostly about you know life-threatening diseases and things like that. Right. I feel like I'm qualified because Max is very well versed on uh, rarediseases.org. <laughs> rare diseases. That's not rare. It's <laughs> that's not rare to call. Yeah. <laughs> it's your next website. So. It's a website. It's on my homepage. So. Well, then it's interesting. That's interesting you say that. So, you know, I got I get like Facebook messages from coaches who I don't know, but who know me and are like, hey, I've got this client with a super rare like disease, you know, and they see this very high end specialist at an academic center, you know, and they're saying they can't train. What do you think? And I'm like, fives. You probably should do fives. Well, I, most of the time, there are only a handful of conditions that would preclude somebody from actually training. So most of the time, I think that off the cuff, like you can't lift, is probably incorrect. However, some of these diseases are super, super rare and have like a whole like, spectrum of how severe they could be. And so for me to just say, hey, I don't know you, I don't know this patient, I don't know anything about them, to say, yeah, it's fine, would be irresponsible. But that's what the, and then the next response is, oh, well, where can I go read more about this? And I'm like, there is not a, something I can send you to to read that's going to like give you the okay to say yeah you can train because if it's not okay to train you know you you might have skipped over that part you know where they talk about <laughs> resistance training you know in the book so yeah that's that's been a really interesting thing but but again i think just getting this information out it's going to help everybody involved yeah i mean i think that's very important work definitely kind of bridging that that gap between the medical world the training the training world you know we're fortunate to be around people like Quinn, Dr. Quinn Hennock doing that between the physical therapy world and actual training. So, you know, they're not just telling them stop squatting, stop deadlifting because your knees hurt, your back hurts. Yeah. You know, so I think you're doing that on even a, a bigger, a bigger scale. Uh, yeah, it's, it's interesting because it just stop lifting or just take a break or can't you just, you know, not, not train for a little bit. You know, I feel like that does more harm than good and the relative risk of 
resistance training in general is so low compared to any medication I could potentially prescribe, any other lifestyle change I could potentially, you know, recommend that I, I, I feel it's almost medical malpractice to say, you know, just take, just stop or you can never lift anything above 20 pounds. It's like, where does that even come from? You know, we, we, in America now, we're always at uh, Tracy Anderson, I think. You're that. right. Yeah. yeah. You're, you're a medical doctor, doctor right? Tracy yeah. Anderson. So you have the, you have pledged the Hippocratic oath. Right. Is that right? So can you, technically you couldn't prescribe bad training to somebody, right? Because that's like, that's going to be like potentially against the, the, it's not ethical. It's not ethical for you to do that. So all of your training programs have to be good. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So, so I've had to get rid of all my bad training programs, yeah. you know, well, and speaking, and, yeah, <laughs> and, and speaking of bad training programs, when we come back from the break, that's in the podcast business, we call that a segue. Ah. Yes. When we come back from the break, we're going to take a little strength history minute. When we come back, we're going to yell at each other about starting strength. It's been a bad training. Odie Wilson was one of the most talented and massive strength athletes of his era, finding body sizes that range anywhere from 6'5 to 6'7, weighing likely somewhere between 400 and 440 pounds. Wilson is said to have 42-inch quads while wearing size 23 shoes and wearing a size 26 ring. Most ring charts that I found while researching this only go up to a size 13. So basically, Odie had a five-pack of bratwurst on each of his hands. He was the 1988 IPF world champion in powerlifting with a 454.2 kilo, 1,002 pound squat, 257 kilo bench press, and 397.5 kilo, 876 pound deadlift for an 1102.2, 2430 total. That was in the you know older single ply equipment and was the world record at the time. He also took second in the 1990 World Strongest Man losing a five and a half point lead on the final event, which was a 200 meter race with a hundred kilo weight on his back. And he lost that to John Paul Sigmarsson. Uh, not exactly a world strongest man type of event necessarily. He also worked as a bodyguard for Michael Jackson and appeared in the 1988 film Cyborg alongside Jean-Claude Van Damme. All right, so we are back from our uh, Strength History Minute. Uh, again, here with Jordan Feigenbaum of Barbell Medicine. And uh, in addition to Barbell Medicine, Jordan is he's, he's kind of high up in the in the starting strength hierarchy. I sit on the right hand of the Ripito. So is that are you the Holy Spirit or? I think I'm Jesus. Okay. He, well, he was a Jew. And then also, you know, a lot of people didn't like him. So I feel like. Yeah, yeah. The similarities you. are. Yeah, they really end there. You have, but you, you have a beard too. I also have a beard. I am not a carpenter, however. Huh. Yeah. I buy a lot of wine. Yeah. Okay. Better than nothing. Yeah. All right. So. <laughs> As avid fans of the the Jug Life podcast, as you are, because that's the only kind that we have, uh, you know that among our favorite topics, you know, when we're not making fun of multiply high squats or uh, providing exemplary information about how to become strong, uh, we we enjoy a few jabs at the starting strength community. Uh, and I think, you know, Jordan and I have talked about this kind of stuff before, but I I want you to. Tell us how we're wrong. What are some? What are some of the misconceptions that that the uninitiated have? Well, okay. I mean, so I think you know the easiest way to do would be like, what are the what are the general assumptions about starting strength that people make? Nonsensical squatting technique. Well, so I think what a lot of it is, you see people who are not coached. They haven't been coached. They've read the book, quote unquote, which. As you know, th think of all the things you've written over time. For sure. And people say, oh, I read your article, and here's what I got from it. And you're like, did you read the same article? Did you read all of it? Like, did you did you read most of it even? You know, and so people will come in, and they'll be doing a good morning squat, and they'll be, you know, really way bent over, and there's effectively no forward knee travel to use the quads or whatever. And they're like, and then you see it, and you're like, oh, no, this ugly, you know, and you call it a ripto squat because you're so pissed you have to fix this again. I, I had a, a crew come into a seminar in Long Island once, like four four people wearing starting strength sweatshirts oh, good. all together, and they all they all did that. They all did that, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah they so, had a sweatshirt, so it seemed pretty official. Shit, right, because if you were wearing a sweatshirt. Yeah, yeah. it wasn't a T-shirt. It's not cheap. The, actually, I think I'm, the only organization that would have a sweatshirt would be starting strength, I feel like. Was it like a gray mm -hmm. cutoff right here? at the forearm no. neck cut out <laughs> no but it 
it was gray I mean, we had that part right okay. but I, I think it was it was a kind of like a gray body with a different colored sleeve oh the letterman the, yeah. we call that the letterman, letterman. Right, right, right. <laughs> so so that squad is not actually what we teach in our seminar for instance and so and invariably you'll have two different types of people show up at the seminar one who have read all the books never been coached though and they're like way bent over their knees don't translate forward at all on the way down and we're like push your knees forward you're going to be more upright than you think that's like one and and that's if they've read the book and they've you know feel like they've and they've trained a little bit themselves that's what they end up like if unless uh, unless they're really athletic or you just pick this up naturally the other type of people have been squatting either high bar for a, a long period of time or, or, or front squats, for instance, and they won't bend over. And you're like, well, if you're going to do a low bar squat, you're going to bend over a little bit more than if the bar's high on your back or if you're doing a front squat. But at the same time, we don't want you to good morning your squats, and we don't want your hips to come up first out of the out of the bottom. Well, I think that's definitely, I mean, some, something that I would even think is being cued when, yeah. Yeah, when you hear hip drive and yeah. you see the meme. And you, and you see the videos of him having his hand on yeah. the low back and telling him to push their hips up yeah and I, I think some of that you know your little sound bites on the internet too and you say well look it's all hips they don't want everything in their hips they don't want any knee, knee translation forward but you know we would like vehemently disagree with the west side squat model where you're to back 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 vertical take it, shin take it, take take, yeah yeah right 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 and you know we're like no you want your knees to go forward so you can use your quads your quads are super strong they ultimately have a ton of motor units stacked up per inch that's why they're way stronger than your posterior chain could be you know why wouldn't you use them that'd be silly to not um yeah, but I think, again, if everyone is being held as to the critical standard that RIP is, where, hey, have you ever given somebody a cue that may be taken out of context, you know, I, I think it's passable. I think perhaps the hip drive cue has been overdone on the internet by people who have, you know, fanboys or whatever who have read the book, seen a video, but not necessarily coached a large swath, swath of people. So I, I rarely will cue just the hips when I'm coaching a squat, unless they're just actively lifting the chest out of the hole and that's messing with their mechanics. And ultimately, I feel like we all want the same thing. If you want a high bar squat or a low bar squat, you want the barbell to move in a straight vertical line yeah. over the middle of the foot. You know, you want repeatable, consistent mechanics, yeah. and we all want that. The back, back and legs together. Yeah, exactly. And so if you can get that without you know cueing hips or knees or chest well that you're just gonna do what you have to do to make the mechanics work so i think that's like probably the biggest misconception and there was a guy on reddit who was ba he basically was like well feigen mom's not even that strong like he squatted 640 but you know it was in wraps and the wraps basically made up for his back angle bending over and i was like i mean yeah you know it was over three times body weight but that, that's cool uh yeah, the wraps don't tend to really affect the back much yeah i've, I've noticed when, well, when i'm squatting in wraps with very strong legs i need like two belts let me right. wear two belts that would be better so then I squatted 600 in knee sleeves, right? And he's like, yeah, well, you're still bent over a lot. I'm like, well, I mean, the bar's pretty low, and I don't really have it's like a super long torso, and also I pulled 725. So anyway, just get off get off my jock. Uh, but his thing was, he's like, I fixed so many rip toe squats. I'm like, well, me too. You know, if you're going to call the uncoached, right. misunderstand, mi misunderstood version of the squat, the rip toe squat, I mean. In the misunderstanding, though, I mean, if, if there's the books out there, you know, sure. starting strength and, and – and practical programming stuff. I mean, uh, I've, I've read Starting Strength. It's probably been a good dozen or so years. Sure. But if it's being so commonly misunderstood, like, shouldn't that be getting addressed on a, on a broader scale? Yeah. So, I mean, there's definitely articles and videos about, like, hey, here's what you're probably doing wrong. So th there's that. And then the other thing is, think about the sample size, right? So Starting Strength is probably the biggest selling yeah. strength training book on Amazon it is certainly and I, I mean I, I I have a rough estimate of how many copies are being sold per year and then you think about the general intelligence of like the world right and then also <laughs> but then also the squat chapter I think it's like 180 pages or something like that and so it, to yeah. get you get through that once and you feel like I got it yeah nay you have to go back through it again, you know, again. It's like you watch watch Westworld, right? You watch it once, and you're like, oh, it's cool. And then you watch it a second time, you're like, whoa, I missed so many things. The third time, you're like, why do I miss so many things again? How is that possible? I've never watched Westworld, but I, th I feel like Arrested Development is like that, Yeah, too. right, 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 the right. jokes, they run deep. It's the same. I, in fact, I compare Westworld to Arrested Development on a daily basis. There's so, so many subtleties. But 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 I think, I think that's an issue with just trying to coach 
remotely in general? I mean, you guys, I mean, how many, your clients are all online, right? And yeah. how many times have you thought to yourself, well, if I just had them in front of me, I could fix this in 30 seconds. But in reality, and you spend a few, a bunch of emails and, you know, and other videos trying to correct the same thing or whatever. And I don't know. So I think misunderstanding is par almost par for the course when you don't have your hands on somebody. I guess, yeah, I mean, I could see it like the, the knees out cue for Kelly Surrett. Like, yeah, you chose this one picture of Diane Fu squatting in a way that no one strong has ever and no, ever squat. You're right. But that's the picture you chose, so that's the one that everyone sees. Sure. At, at least in that particular case, I feel like he's he's really dug in on, on that cue. And I, I, I'm not sure if I can speak one way or the other because I'm just not a purveyor of a lot of Ripito content to know if he's sort of done the same on that. But Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I think I, I would obviously admit like my certain bias being involved on this side so you know it'd be very difficult to say well i'm free from bias you know i mean i stand to gain if starting strength does very well you know and i i would i think rip's been great to me so far so i feel like i owe him in, in a way so that's me like publicly like admit you know saying hey this is my bias okay but at the same time i don't think it would be fair to characterize rip squad as like all hips you know good morning you know just use just use your back to lever the bar up because that's not necessarily what they, we want. They put their hands on the bar in a weird manner. Well, yeah, well, well for the, for the Dan elbows. E wait, so you're talking about the false grip, the thumbless grip? Yeah, but it's almost it's not even the thumb. The, the people I see do it at seminars is like it's a handless grip. Sure. So so grab so the they're the crook of my wrist. Right. It's <laughs> like an orangutan sort of thing. Like they're up like this, and we that's wrong. So I actually I actually wrote the article, the grip problem, discussing this exact thing. Like that's not where the grip should be. We want the, the hand as far sunk down on the bar as possible, ideally with a neutral wrist. If you cannot maintain a neutral wrist, uh, then you're gonna wrap your thumb around. Just run some like Facebook ads for these articles, I mean, for the articles. or something. Because, well, but again, th think about consuming. I have to fix these. Sure. Problems anymore. Well, think about think about this. All right. So the average person who probably comes into your gym after having read Starting Strength bought the second edition ten years ago, didn't really read it, has not kept current with all the new material, right? And then you look at their squat, and you're like, oh my gosh, this is trash. Ripito is trolling me again. You know. <laughs> but I I don't know if that's fair to. That's just like if I see a guy who comes in and he's super upright and you know his heels are coming off and he's like, yeah, I read Max's squat article and I've been squatting every day and this is what I do and I'm like, oh Max. Again, why do you do this? Send me coach, he sends me coaching links all the time to this website, and <laughs> it makes me feel like shit all the time. All right, well, let's let's move on then to to our next issue, and this will be more of Max can handle this one more, but it's it's Mark Ripito, the weightlifting coach, low yeah, bar squats. Dude, and this is this is something that it I I feel like it was like a <clears throat> it died for a minute. Like there was the Mark talked a lot about the 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 low bar squat as a better means to train for weightlifting. You know, makes you stronger because you can train with more weight. The mimics the first pull, et cetera, et cetera. And I'd seen that argument a lot, and then that kind of died. But actually, recently I've seen it come back where there's been. I saw Steffi Cohen mention that you know doing low bar squats to make your weightlifting better, and I, I, it seems like she that's. Said that? Yeah. She blocked me on Instagram. Well. She does a lot of weightlifting meets. She, oh, she, yeah. Signs up for she signed oh, really? up for a bunch of weightlifting meets. She blocked, so she used a, a starting strength, like, picture yeah. on her. I, it wasn't a picture, no. She actually said it in a post. Someone sent it to me that, oh. you know, she does. She was saying, you know, because it's general, it's not a specific exercise, you might as well just do the one that allows you to lift the most weight because that'll have the greatest impact, which is a huge stretch uh yeah so so for for a barbell based sport sure where not, you could train yeah. specifically yeah sure. okay. interesting to me where rip stands on that and like that's the it seems odd because he has very little experience as a weightlifting coach right or with weightlifting yeah so i i do not know the entirety right. of his weightlifting coaching history i know that wichita falls athletic club did host the midwestern university's weightlifting team penley was there at the yeah. time and i know a handful of lifters who have come out from from, yeah, from yeah. that okay uh so i do know though at the seminars for instance when he, rip talks about this and usually someone will ask like you know him about usaw yeah <laughs> all right and so and then he's like He'll say something like, well, look, if you squat 800 or 600, if you have a strong squat, sure. I don't care if you do it high bar or low bar. You're, you've gotten strong. Right. However, if you're weak and your high bar squat is not going up you know, routinely and you're right. not strong, 
maybe you should try a low bar. That that would be his right. moderate stance. And I think yeah. I think a few drinks in, maybe that changes for everyone. You know, you <laughs> have to draw your line in the sand. And I do think that may be a more moderate approach than what it had previously been. Yeah, it definitely sounds more moderate because yeah, Pro- probably a more nuanced thing. Possibly, yeah. I think the what about the deadlift? Do you think that weightlifters should, because he would argue vehemently that they should pull heavy sets of five, for instance. So that's something that's actually what's that five five that's one of those things that's been that's always been interesting because i think there's within the spectrum of weightlifting and and all coaching and all the systems around the world there's all sorts of different successful versions of it sure. right and because weightlifting is a little bit less critical in the sense of like you can as long as people are very powerful and you have training that develops the right qualities you can have really varied forms of technique and varied sure. systems within that that develop these lifters. The drug issue probably plays a big role in that too. Sure. It used to be that nobody, you know, in especially in UCW, but nobody did heavy pulls. Nobody did any kind of heavy deadlifting. And more recently, you know, and there's probably I'm sure Ripito would back it up, but more recently we saw a lot of the European guys come over, Klokovs and these guys, and talk about doing heavy deadlifting. Um, I do think the volumes, like the really heavy fives, are probably done much, much less often. And as the qualification goes up, the timing is really yeah, far. The timing yeah. of them relative to yeah. the competitive season. Sure. Right. Yeah. So There's in a more developmental block versus yeah, way, you know, way far from competition. Sure. Yeah. But I would, I would think that it's, it's, it's hard to say where I would, I wouldn't agree with it as much. Like with the, the in Mark sense, where he was probably talking more about, like what he would say, I think would go more into like the LSU kind of program. So if you guys know what Kendrick Ferris and those guys were doing, where sure. they would do Kyle down there tens and fives, really heavy pulling and stuff. It's just not as productive because. You know, like you said, it's like you can't do it that often. Sure. You can't do it that much. It's going to be early in the developmental cycle where it's basically just GPP at that point. Sure. By the time they're actually lifting these heavy weights, you know, it's the right. transference is lower. Yeah. The counter argument would be, well, if that's your developmental, it's like you're developing sure. your strength base. Sure. Yeah. As, as how much will the technique decay right. during that time? Sure. Yeah. How well, far can you get away from it? Right. And and. It, the counter would be well if you're still doing some you know, yeah. exposure to lift. In, in my sense, like that that argument with Rip is actually not like a big, it's not a big issue to me because a lot Max of what he's just talking said about he is, agreed. Well, because he's he's talking mostly about being strong. Sure. Right. Yeah. Which you have is to be like, I get to be, it. Like yeah. that's your method of how you're going to develop strength and lifters. Strength is never a weakness. Yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> in a sense of like the technical side of it, which I think was the bigger issue of people, where he's talking about the low bar squatting and and. The changing the technique a lot to mimic right the first pull the, first pull the snatch recovery things. yeah where Al- he's... although yeah the snatch recovery does use hip drive uh it depends so delega has got uh, like this 205 squat or sna- uh, snatch rather in like the back of this training room yeah yeah and it, there's some like you know mole of a coach sitting over i think he looks like he's sleeping zigmund Z- yeah. he became the u.s coach right right no, i got it but i think he was sleeping at the time you know <laughs> probably right so and then delega squats 205 at that time would have been a world a world record um snatches snatch sorry yeah snatches 205 yeah and this monster hip drive you know coming out of the deal and so and we show that at the seminar saying you know on, on some heavy snatches in the recovery, there is certainly hip yeah. drive, and you could make an argument to yeah. suggest that using hip drive and and uh, uh, using that sort of. Um, but that's kind of it's, yeah. It's like it, uh, the bar is going backwards. If you're going to lose it behind you, you lift your ass up. Yeah, to, to counterbalance forward. Yeah. Sure. It's it's a in that regard, it's more probably more that it's like a that's the equivalent of like reverse band deadlifting, where it's like. You're gonna make something kind of strong or lift this weight, like you don't need to practice that position. Sure. It's just so unlikely someone like you might have one rare guy like Delega who just can't stand with a snatch, but the likelihood of having somebody not strong enough to, to you know, get up their snatch. You know, it's sure. it's more just shifting their hips higher so they can, you know, remove their legs from the equation and kind of lever themselves into position. Sure. Or they're off balance. So the specificity would be you you feel like that's not a good argument to use the lower It's, it's kind of like yeah, I mean, I wouldn't say it's necessary because you have to think about the training volume you have. You only yeah. have so much work you can do. Sure. Doing low bar squats in place of what you could do something that would be more beneficial globally or even to a more specific issue. Sure. 
obviously if you have a guy who's like if you have a lifter i'm saying who's stuck in the snatch in that position probably take him out back and shoot him because <laughs> well they probably not gonna not do a lifter maybe not yeah he's just yeah. not gonna do yeah. much yeah. anywhere else yeah you're getting yeah. stuck in the snatch you're kind of right yeah. you're a power lifter bro yeah <laughs> Be, just look come join us put knee wraps on like fucking bomb put another 200 <laughs> 200 pounds on your squat and you're well, good right. so with between the beard the knee wraps like yeah. the, the you know 24 hour 48 hour weigh-in well Was you that? just mailed it in how much did you weigh i saw 100 i wait yeah three I weighed in at 196. <laughs> right? Who was helping you? Who was spotting you? Yeah, exactly. Was it your, right. Was it was related Rolla to Dad. you? Dad. Dad. <laughs> <laughs> there was not even a scale in the gym. So it was a, it was a Lillibridge meet. Fake and weights. I, uh, yeah, fake weights, fake news. <laughs> the whole thing. The meet didn't even happen. Castleberry and the head judge chair. Yeah, Castleberry was in my weight class. He was also 198 that day. <laughs> yeah, he benched 650, but, you know, it was for a triple. So. How many people did we just offend? One. Not enough. <laughs> there's Not there's enough. one kid right now watching this in tears, like <laughs> what? He just trolled everyone. What? So yeah, I think I think uh, you. So for instance, Mary Peck, she's a uh, one of yeah. her, and she squats yeah. low bar. Also, Annie Thor's daughter just published a uh, you know at the end of like this ten minute find a max squat, squat at 140 kilos low bar. It was funny because I was at Rip's house right, and and somebody had tagged me in the comment section, and I I showed Rip. And I put on my Instagram story, and he goes, "Just a perfect starting strength squat." <laughs> oh, Mary. And I, I tagged no Annie Torres' daughter. Oh, and I tagged Annie, you know, hoping to slide in the DMs. Yeah, it's um, and yeah, Mary. Mary is a fantastic weightlifter and very talented, but I think the argument can be made, and I've heard it made by such physical therapists, professionals as uh, the Dr. Quinn, yeah, sure. that her lengthy list of hip injuries he thinks is yeah. being exacerbated by by the different angles created in the low bar squat and the more f- deeper you know, flexion in the hip. But it's possible. I may I, my and, I, and again, no, nobody, none of us. Yeah, have yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, but my counter. Ooh. My counter would be well. There's a lot of squat snatching and and front, you know, clean recoveries that are also, and that's dynamically loaded compared to the squat, which is more controlled. But in any event, uh, yeah, I don't know. I think a lot of the this rip stuff is misunderstood, you know. So I I think if you guys actually, and I hate to speak for him, right? Because he's gonna call me up and say, Feigenbaum, yeah, Feigenbaum, why'd you go on this podcast talk about what I have to say about fives and hip drive you know he's gonna say that and i they be like well rip i was just there and you know i wanted to, i wanted to clear this stuff up so for the internet i'm clearing this stuff up i i think that you guys probably i mean your method of getting weightlifters ready to go to a meet in addition to getting their technique on point would be getting them strong you i mean you agree with that yeah and so and so how your method is slightly is different but I don't know if there's too much different, you know, there, there's probably somewhere, some, another coach somewhere else in the world said, you know, you don't need to get stronger. You're just tech, your technique needs to get better. I mean, I don't know. Yeah, Is it, do people, yeah, there's people like that for sure. There's people that don't, I mean, they're going to have, I, I get the whole, the variation, right? We all have our own approach to the strategy, right? I think what, what is sort of funky is that there's these little tidbits that sort of linger where it's one thing if like, you know, Rip, Rip's got a thing or Chad's got a thing where it's like, Hey, Here's what I think is this way to do it. That gets kind of spread as like a whatever. It's an idea. People discuss it. It kind of – we move on from that. Sure. It's that those nuggets – there's a couple of those nuggets in there that just sort of stay forever it seems like. And that, you know, the technique low bar thing is like this argument when it's odd to me that like – if it's so much more effective, we would have discovered. Like the Chinese have done it. Like the Chinese probably bought the low. Like Chinese bought starting strength, did it all for ten years with two hundred people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Like they did yeah. everything I and tried everything. Right? Yeah, they I, all died. I, I remember <laughs> at that that Klokov Ilya uh, Polovnikov seminar, yeah. doing these little videos with Vasily Polovnikov, in which I asked him about low bar squatting for weightlifting and using bands, right. and. And the low bar squatting one, like, he didn't understand what I meant at first. So then I, like, showed him. I was, I was like, you know, th- not the bar here, but but here uh, and here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And he just looked at me. He's like, why? Right. Why? But, yeah. <laughs> but, but all of their people squat, you know, 300 kilos plus. You yeah. Know? So I, I think, and I think Rip's argument would be, Look, if we're having issues developing strength in somebody, we can use more weight on the low bar, and perhaps that would allow them to manifest more force production in other 
and other lifts. Yeah, and I, I guess some of it'd be tough. It'd be you know, it's hard. you have to run this double blind, like randomized. Yeah. Oh, I can't feel the bar in the and, low bar position. And I, I think <laughs> a lot of that gets gets to a a bigger issue of that Max has talked a lot about in regards to the squat and its role in weightlifting. Is it to lift more weight or is it to make your legs stronger? Right, specifically as they apply to the clean and jerk yeah. and the snatch. Because even sure. in American lifters, it is not he who has the biggest squat who lifts the most weight. No. You know, it's, it's, it's kind of like a, a big squat is great if it's a byproduct you know, to to great training, not if it is the goal of great training. The goal sure. is the goal of powerlifting, but weightlifters who have big squats, like, yeah, there are times where raising the numbers in the squat is the focus, but there are times when it needs to not be the focus because just how much you can squat isn't, you know, yeah. a big squat a great weightlifter does not make. Yeah, I, th- I think in elite weightlifting, you sort of get, you know, a lot of this gets con- conflated too because you have i mean you're at high level genetics and they great yeah, a lot, coaching a lot of variables yeah and all, all the selection bias has already occurred and you're like you see these things and it's hard to make a lot of sense of that you on the other hand you have these recreational wet weightlifters who are like i want to go to a meet and i really just want to snatch 100 and clean and jerk yeah, 140 yeah. and you're like yeah but you only squat 140 right and you keep trying to train their high bar squat and for whatever reason it's not consistent productive whatever and you're like mm, yeah it's it, maybe it you low bar a, to drive your because then if you got this guy low when, bar yeah and general strength is going to be a fast the same idea in throwing this is why america struggles in like the hammer throw because the the quickest way to throw the hammer pretty far is to get really strong really fast sure but it actually inhibits in the long their long-term development because they've lost some of these movement qualities and and speed qualities by you know spending all this extra time getting strong versus actually throwing the hammer and the technical development but we could go on on and on and much more lengthy discussion about this let's take another quick break uh in which we are gonna take a minute to get to know Mr. Max Montana Ada. In case that people seem confused, they think that that Montana is a nickname. It's actually his middle name, as well as where he's from. If I was going to do a different sport other than lifting, what would I want to do? Uh, I don't even. That's a hard one. I would, you know, I don't. Do I have to be good at it? I guess not. Like, because uh, I'm probably not a very good athlete at the other stuff. <laughs> the first time I ran in front of my wife, she turned around. We had to run to a bus stop. So I, I was running behind her to catch a bus stop. She turned around and looked at me, and she told me later she felt bad watching me run. She, she felt, like, noticeably distraught, seeing that she had put somebody in a place that they had to do that with their body in public. Uh, so, I mean, I would, you know, a sport I would pick would probably be something that's totally different, like... I don't know, some kind of like field sport or something. I mean, golf ball or something really popular. Orienteering, golf ball, uh, handball. Uh, I don't know other. Team handball or Mexican <laughs> handball. Uh, high ally. High sounds cool because you got basically a weapon and a ball, and that sounds like that sounds like it'd be cool. Anything I think that if I was, you know, if I was going to do a different sport, I would pick a sport that allowed me to associate with a different type of person, like really rich people, like my, like Miami Vice kind of people. Like, you know, you go in and you walk in and you have like a blazer rolled up. Don Johnson's waiting for you to play your next match. Racquetball, maybe. That would be fucking cool. Buying tickets to sports and events can be complicated. There's a better, simpler way to buy with SeatGeek. SeatGeek is the smartest, easiest way to get tickets to live events. With SeatGeek's seamless mobile experience, you can buy and sell tickets in just two taps. SeatGeek helps you find the best seats at the best prices, fully guaranteed. There's nothing quite like seeing your favorite team or musician in person, and SeatGeek will get you closer to the action for a great value. I have the SeatGeek app on my phone. It's by far the easiest way I've found to shop for tickets. I can be anywhere, and with just a few taps, I can instantly find seats. I actually just used SeatGeek to buy tickets when we were in Ireland to go see the Ireland versus Fiji rugby game. SeatGeek is designed to make your ticket buying experience easier than ever. SeatGeek saves you time and money by searching multiple ticket sites to compare prices and find amazing deals. And it gets you the most bang for your buck. SeatGeek grades every ticket based on value to help you immediately identify the best seats to fit your budget. Plus, every purchase is fully guaranteed, so you can shop for tickets on SeatGeek with confidence. Make SeatGeek your go-to app for finding the best deals on every type of ticket from sports and concerts to comedy and theater. Best of all, 
Jug Life listeners get $20 off their first SeatGeek purchase. So just download the SeatGeek app and enter the promo code Jug Life. That's promo code Jug Life for $20 off your first SeatGeek purchase. All right, so we are back from getting to know the Montana madman Max Ada. And uh, so what I want to talk to Jordan about now, obviously a well-read, intelligent, well-trained young man are what what are some of your resources that you uh that you look to to learn about you know things that make you better at lifting things yeah better yeah lifting lifting things uh yeah that's interesting so i do read a lot of your guys stuff uh yeah obviously so yeah yeah thanks thanks for all the gains guys um i do say subscribe to journals which you know the stuff that comes out of there isn't terribly practical for like strength athletes you know because it's like oh 20 untrained college students you know gained 20 kilos on their bench press if they benched regularly and we're like duh (laughs) yeah um but you know also i read uh i read uh a lot of zordos stuff and dr jake wilson his stuff and uh rts whatever mike mike and those guys put out um yeah it's been interesting i don't know you know have you read mass uh, this is Greg Knuckles. Uh, yeah, yeah. I've I've seen two of two of them. There's maybe it just came out with like the fourth one mm-hmm. this past week. Yeah, I you know dabble in that, but at the same time, I'm also keeping up with you know medical, the medical stuff, and that stuff all just gets auto sent to my email. I have uh, it's like it's called uh, Journal Watch, so any keyword that I tag like basically pops in. So basically, I have an inbox full of creatine articles. No, <laughs> it's all. It's, that's all I want to know, and then testosterone and the other and the other one, um, but yeah, that's usually uh, those are the things I usually look to for for training uh, related stuff. You know, at this level, I mean, think about you, you've already read Zetsorski, you've already read uh, Yesarin stuff, you've already read Bondarchuk stuff. We well, read it. Everyone says they've read it. That's true. That's just like reading Starting Strength. Yeah, yeah, but you can go back to it and you can still learn new stuff. Like the science and practice of strength conditioning from Zetsorski is. I think it's great. It's a very dense text. Yeah. And so when you say you've read it, I quit. And then you're like, what do I read next? It's like, if you've actually finished it and you get it, you'll know what's next. Yeah. That, that one, yeah, never really clicked for me. All the super training, super training, I didn't like stuff. Yeah. Yeah, Didn't 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 really click for me until, uh, Max, Max's former roommate, James Smith, the thinker. Ah, yes. Yeah. Uh, he worked for me for about a year and I got to see him put this stuff into practice. And at that point I was like, oh, so it's the simplest, most intuitive answer (laughs) written in, written in the most convoluted language possible. Right, right. Well, you can say in seven words, let's say in 700 and then you still, and not give no examples at the end, you know? Yeah. I was like, uh, Dr. Mike, uh, I'm not actually really sure what happened in this project, but he was supposed to be translating a uh Sheko book they they had a translator to go from russian to english and then mike was going to go from english to human ah right i yeah. see do you like do you like Sheko stuff uh you know we had him for the seminar and it just seemed like very you know basic sport science I, oh i trained with yeah. him I, oh yeah i did remote coaching with him several years ago now i i, I liked it i mean it's like a weightlifting i mean it's all it's all taken from medvedev's you know, his basically like his system of weightlifting turned into powerlifting. I mean, so you're doing you're doing a, a bunch of frequency and volume and very specific stuff. Yeah. Oh, that's weird. It works. Yeah, it's strange. Oh, weird. Weird. You wouldn't like just change exercises all the time and like wave up intensities to non sport specific things and like. <laughs> we would do once we got into the circum max phases. Then we would do bands and chains and yeah, boxes. They, they and did not, some not squatting to depth. They did it. some ones. They did some tens. So you could pretty much just average say, out to fives. Average out to fives. I, that's what I heard. That you just do fives. <laughs> but well, you know that's interesting. So on our our podcast. Uh, this last week we were talking about you know if your five RM is going up you can reasonably ascertain that you're getting stronger. However, how that translates to a one RM you don't really know, especially if you're not practicing singles a lot. You know because it's a skill in and of itself to take all the strength that you've developed and display it in a true you know shit one RM. So if you're not regularly practicing your sport, yeah, you may get some decay in your actual sports performance. But if it's a GPP block, maybe you don't care about that. You know sure. at the time. So. So what what is next for uh, Barbell Medicine? Projects, products, anything coming up? Yeah, so you know we're we're slaying in supplements. Still not doing Lincoln Bio because I still have my soul. Uh, no. <laughs> 
He actually has his coupon code is written under. Yeah, his, yeah, which you can't. Under his shirt, he's going to take I'm going to take it. Jordan 27, and it's a 3% discount. It's a th <laughs> um, but no, we're expanding. So Alan Thrall, he, so he got his starting strength coaching uh -huh, credential, yeah. and so um, he wanted to do some remote coaching. So he's working with us. Uh, Austin Baraki, he's, an, he's another doc, and he's working with us as well. And, yeah, so we're expanding a little bit, trying to trying to get the message out. We've got seminars, so we're going to Sacramento. We were going to go to your gym down in yeah. – you but, come and hang out my garage. Yeah, well, well, so now we're coming to your garage, <laughs> which you don't know is thirty people are descending upon your garage. But yeah, so the barbell medicine seminars are going uh, are going up, so they're on our website barbellmedicine.com, and we send a newsletter out every week, so you can go sign up for that at our website. We uh, we I do a lot of trivia. That's my favorite part of the newsletter. Is like five things you don't know. Five right. things you don't know. Well, Right. Yeah. I, I thought you would appreciate that. So, so just for the while you're here, uh, what animals besides humans can get, get sunburned? Um, hmm. I was ab about to say giraffes, but I know it's I, I thought giraffes and sunburned because their tongue can't be sunburned. Right. That's why it's black. Right. Um, pigs. Yes. That's one. There's three. Oh, there's three. Uh, That's really good. I'm impressed. How did you guess that? From Colin Courtney's pig, I looked at it and I was like, that thing could be sunburned. I yeah. just thought they turned to bacon. You can't get sunburned. Uh, <laughs> That's extra sunburn. That's, <laughs> right. yeah. uh, is it whales? It is not whales. So hippopotami, hippopotamus, hip, hippopotami can get sunburned and also freshly sheared sheep. Okay, that All makes right. sense. And you, the, Speaking of hippopotami or triggered <laughs> by a hippopotami, do you know what a group of moose is called? It's not a school. No. Nope. It's not like a bully. No. Nope. Okay. So there's a, a herd is one of the names, which is lame. Yeah, right. A, a fangle. What? Yes. And it, it's weird that, you know, a gaggle of geese, it should be a fangle of meese. Yeah. But. <laughs> I like what you did there. <laughs> moose are really dangerous. Max would know. Montana, when you get near it. What was your pet moose's name in Montana? It's extremely dangerous. <laughs> The public, I, this is a public obviously bull eagle. Anyone, yeah, it's anyone that doesn't know how dangerous a moose is, clearly don't venture into the wilderness of Montana alone. I still can't believe you're from Montana. Yeah, I don't believe you. I live in a log cabin. I was like, I did, yeah. yeah. And you just squat thirty times a week. That was that was after we moved into the city. I, I was a city folk then. <laughs> <laughs> he, was, he was home broken all right so that was the one and then i'll give you a second one and then we can i'm just glad i nailed my yeah no you you crushed it what is the largest tire manufacturer in the entire world who makes the most tire you don't need to sign up you both neither of you need to sign up for a newsletter because you're too smart that's impressive how did you know that i have an 11 year old <laughs> ah, ah. If you have kids, maybe you knew that. Yeah, they make like 370 million tires per year. In the world. Yeah, Michelin only makes like 170 mil. Yeah. Are we, so we're talking about number of tires. Right. Not, not, not like absolute, but they use more rubber. Huh. That hmm. seems inefficient. Huge ass tires also <laughs> manufactures large. You can find them on North 7th, Bozeman Avenue. <laughs> if you're interested. It's funny. It's funny. Um, yeah. Otherwise, I'm just uh, doing shirtless Instagram lives on the daily. Uh, Jordan underscore barbell medicine. I make my breakfast in the morning, and I don't put a shirt on. Do you wear a shirt in your own house? Uh, from time to time. Never. What's your pants situation like, though? Well, they can't. They, nobody's ever seen my belly button on Instagram. No. So, like, you don't need to know. That's where you draw the line. Yeah, that's where I draw the line, yeah. Yeah, that's where I draw the line. Like, you can't see that. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. But that's what I do. I do the Instagram lives daily while I'm making breakfast, and uh, people always troll me. But it's just dudes. It's, there's no chicks there. There's a lot of dudes on there. Yeah. They just get angry at your naked body. Right. They're like Your big pecs are just pissing me off, buddy. Right. Your body hair's not natty. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, dude, I know it's Jewish. If I was in that room with you, I'd be so close to your face right now, you could taste my lips. I'd just tell you off. <laughs> oh. your shirt back on. And <laughs> stop being so sweaty and muscular. People say, put your shirt back on. Yeah, people say, put your... And I was like, it's my own house. Put your shirt on. They're my own eggs. They're like, aren't you afraid the hair's going to get in your eggs? I'm like, no, I hope it does extra protein. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, right. <laughs> where can uh, where can they find you? Yep. So barbellmedicine.com is our website. We put out articles there regularly. Um, also, you can sign up for our newsletter. Jordan underscore Barbell Medicine is where you can find me on Instagram. That's probably where I'm most active on the internet. He's uh, yeah, got a podcast now too. Barbell yeah. Medicine podcast. Barbell Medicine podcast. It's on creative I name. Yeah. 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 We really. Yeah. yeah. Well, we want to do Barbell Medicine Five, but it was hard. <laughs> already taken so you can find us on itunes stitcher uh soundcloud and the tubes we have a youtube channel all right yeah. well speaking of podcasts 
<laughs> Here's uh, the best one. Yeah. <laughs> if you enjoy the Jug Life podcast, uh, please go over to iTunes. Give us a five-star review. We'll write us something nice and or funny. Uh, we always appreciate that. It helps more people find the podcast. Like Fit Life of Cam, who told us, one of the most informative, helpful, and entertaining fitness-related pos- podcasts out there. I listen to every podcast during work and then watch the YouTube video later just to look into those baby blues. Kidding. Kind of. I take notes. I'm a beginner powerlifter and trying to learn how to do my own programming since I can't afford a coach. Each episode helps me get more knowledge as how to do this. Thank you. No, thank you, Fit Life of Cam. If you send me an email, chat at jtsstrength.com, I'll send you a t shirt or something. Uh, beyond that, make sure to check out the events section of store.jtsstrength.com for any upcoming seminars, powerlifting or weightlifting with me and Max. Visit juggernautcoaching.com for our powerlifting, weightlifting, and super total coaching. And subscribe to YouTube. We're always proud of the content we put up here. Um, yeah, powerlifting, weightlifting, all kind of nonsensical Rocky montages and, uh, and anything else. So, Max, where can they find you? You can find me on Instagram, Max underscore Ada, or on Facebook. If you have any questions or inquiries about the uh, Juggernaut Online Coaching, email me, max at jtsstrength.com. And I'm Chad Wesley Smith at Chad Wesley Smith and at Juggernaut Training on Facebook and Instagram, filling up your news feed all day. Thank you to uh, Dr. Feigenbaum yeah, hey. for joining us today, for putting up with our Thank you. blasphemous uh, you know, assaults on starting strength. But uh, hopefully, you know, maybe one person is going to be like, oh, yeah, I'll, I'll push my knees forward. Yeah, we'll see. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week.